All right, um, let's start. Um, we finished our discussion of uh, supervised learning. This chapter is over, um, and we start a new one. So what we're going to discuss now is neural decoding. And uh, what I want you to think about is um, something, a concept that we discussed um, um, in the first lecture, the introductory lecture, which is the receptive field. So just as an example, um, we might be presenting an oriented bar to an animal, to uh, visually, uh, to an animal, and uh, observing activity, say, in uh, the visual cortex. And so we could have an oriented bar um, with some angle theta, okay? And we might uh, measure the uh, activity of a particular neuron in the, in the cortex. So, um, it will be selective to various things. For example, uh, this neuron might not respond if the bar is in most places in the visual scene, but if it's in a particular area of the visual scene, it would respond. But then it would, we would find that it also, the firing rate of the neuron depends on the orientation of the bar. So, so if we would plot uh, the firing rate as a function <coughs> of theta, either going from zero to two pi, we might, uh, for, for a particular neuron, see something that looks like this. 
So this is what we call the tuning curve of the neuron. Tuning curve with respect to a very particular parameter, which is uh, this, uh, this angle. Right? Um, and uh, if we would uh, present another, um, um, uh, if we would look at, uh, say, at another neuron in the same uh, area, we might find a neuron that is selective uh, to a different uh, orientation. So this might look like this. So this would be neuron two. And this is neuron one. So uh, obviously, um, the activity of these neurons carries information about the orientation of the bar. And we might be able to, by reading out, uh, by looking at the activity of these neurons, we might learn something about its orientation. And this is what we call decoding. We want to um, decode theta based on the neural activity. And some just, just but let's uh, just uh, mention some other examples of tuning curves. So this is this one was the uh, uh, visual, and other examples uh, say auditory. We might, as an example, present a tone and observe activity of various neurons and look at their activity as a function of the frequency of the tone, maybe of some other parameters. Um, both these examples are um, sensory. Um, you can think of non-sensory examples, or at least not directly sensory examples. We can, for example, a very nice example is the places in a hippocampus, uh, cells that Far de depending on the an position of the animal in its environment. This is not a direct sensory variable. Um, we can define tuning curves. Um, and observe the activity of these cells and try to read out from it the position of the animal. Um, head direction cells is another nice ex similar example. Cells that fire uh, depending on the uh, orientation of the head relative to the environment. Okay, so um, so the general question of decoding is how can we decode a variable from the from the activity? Um, so, for example, here, how accurately can we decode data from the, from the activity of the cells? And note this is not necessarily, usually not a single cell question. We, we don't expect to be able to read theta well just from looking at the activity of one cell. We'll discuss in more depth in a moment, but for example, in this value of theta, this cell is just not responsive. Um, so it's a population, it might be a population question. We might say, ask how well can we decode theta based on the whole activity of a population of cells? Um, and so what I want to discuss with you for a moment is um, what does the readout precision depend on? So in this example, what would the readout precision depend on? Okay, so maybe it depends on the width of this tuning curve. Maybe yes, maybe no. We'll discuss this in more depth uh, later. <coughs> So, by the way, if we look at this particular cell, um, if, it, if the tuning curve is more narrow, do you think that uh, the precision of readout will be better or worse? For one cell or for two? Hmm? For Just for a single cell. One cell? If, the, if the width of this tuning curve is narrower or wider, do you think that the precision of readout will be better or worse? Well, it depends if the... If worse in which case? No, but if it's narrow, if it's narrow, it's you say it's worse? Why? Because uh, you will get zero activity from Okay, very good. So, if, for example, if theta is here, then uh, if we make the tuning curve uh, narrower, um, then, you know, for example, here, then maybe the cell will not respond anymore at all. 
but um, if theta is around here, and we, we, when we make the tuning curve more narrow, then actually the activity of the cell will become more sensitive to the value of theta, so maybe readout will be more precise. So we will quantify these uh, aspects uh, later on more precisely. Um, but you can see that the answer is not clear cut. What else could the, the, uh, the readout precision depend on? Okay, density and number of neurons. Number of neurons, Okay, so, uh, so read the number of neurons <coughs> that we're trying to read out from. We have more, probably intuitively it makes sense that we, we, we would might be able to read out more precisely. It's what else? Our Right, so um, we'll discuss this. It's a good question. What, who is reading out? Uh, for, for now, we're doing an experiment. We're showing a bar. <coughs> we're looking, imagine that we're looking at the activity of a, a bunch of cells, and we want to ask how well could we read out uh, the activity, the, the, the parameter from the, from the activity. Um, okay, density, number of neurons. Um, what else? In this plot, what else characterizes it in addition to the width? Mean. Yeah, the mean or the peak firing rate. Um, yes, maybe. Yes. No, so no, I, I what I mean is the peak is not is just. Still, if all of them fire more rapidly, then maybe we, should, we would be able to read out more precisely. Okay, so that's a, this is you're, you're really leading to my next question, which is that I, I claim that something is still something very fundamental is missing in, in, in the discussion. The yes, absolutely. So uh, if and this is directly related to what, what you said, if, if the activity of the cells would be, if, if cell would give us a firing rate like as a, as a continuous number which is completely deterministic given the, the parameter uh, and we can, read it out, we can read it out at infinite precision, then, um, you know, then even just one cell, uh, regardless of the firing rate, would be enough to read out theta with complete precision. Even if theta is here, then there is some firing rate, we'll be able to measure it and uh, say what is theta. Maybe the only problem with one cell is that we will not be able to distinguish between this and this. Okay. So if noise is essential, viability or viability in the activity of the cells is essential in order to make all this discussion meaningful. But isn't it captured by the width? Oh. No, because given the value of theta, as long as the firing rate of the, the output of the cell is some deterministic continuous value, we would be able to, by observing this value, say precisely what theta is, right? Okay. So what we are going to um, do in the next um, few, I don't know, two, three weeks, probably three, is discuss uh, this question under concrete models of variability. For example, <coughs> The most simple um, model that we wor will work with is Poisson spiking model. So, down, Poisson spiking. Um, each neuron in the experiment gives us a certain number of spikes, <coughs> NNI, and this variable is Poisson um, with mean lambda I of theta. Okay, we have a population, so for each neuron this function is different. This is what we call the tuning curve. So now it doesn't really represent the, the, the direct output of the cell, it, it represents it, the mean of its output. 
And <coughs> furthermore, um, once we discuss more than one neuron, we have to discuss whether the, the noise is, is somehow correlated or not. So for now, we'll assume that uh, noise is independent. So So for any two neurons um, conditioned on theta, once theta is set, each neuron draws its number of spikes from its own mean independently of the other. Um, of course, if we're not discussing this conditioned on theta, and we would uh, pr uh, present, present uh, the brain with uh, various uh, uh, orientations of the bars, and the neurons would be highly correlated or anti-correlated, for example, this neuron and this neuron, uh, you know, if this neuron fires, it fires in this rate, this neuron is firing in this rate. So, but conditioned on theta, our assumption is that uh, um, the variability is independent. So, um, but more generally, we could imagine any relationship between the stimulus and the probability of the outputs, which would we, we could write as something like P of N1, N2, up to N, you know, the whole number of neurons conditioned on theta. So this could be anything. It could be the neurons could be correlated, uh, could the, the, the variability could be correlated in different neurons conditioned on theta. This is a very general uh, statement of the problem. Uh, so, um, so let's maybe it's a good idea to discuss just briefly why, why the neural activity is uh, is variable at all. Okay. Oh, so, so it makes sense that it has to do with uh, somehow with a mechanistic way that the brain, that neurons work. But uh, the question of um, what is the source of noises in the brain is a very deep and uh, still unresolved question. We just know that if we present the brain with the same stimulus again and again, and observe the activity of neurons, we will not get each time exactly the same uh, activity. So we can imagine that uh, um, noise comes from particular sources, maybe synaptic transmission, maybe something intrinsic in the way that the neuron decides to generate spikes, some noise intrinsic to the neuron, maybe some other processes. Uh, we're not going to discuss this in depth in this uh, course, but we just know that neurons are, are noisy. Um, we also know that uh, in the, at least in the cortex, in many cases, um, even if we, uh, we just observe spontaneous activity of neurons or we present a stimulus and, and look at the number of spikes that the neuron generates in a, in a time interval, it's a fairly good approximation to say that uh, this is distributed as a Poisson variable. It's not a precise statement. Now, um, what about this? Um, and, and certain, and, but the Poisson model is also just the most simple model of stochasticity in a point process, in a process that generates uh, spikes, and this is why we're discussing it here, just as a way to start to think about uh, these questions of how noise affects the ability of the system to encode some variable and how could we could decode it. Okay, so um, what about this uh, uh, assumption of independence? Um, can you imagine reasons why it might not be correct? Okay, so first, what do, what do you mean by, okay, so that's the stimulus, but, but here we said given theta, well, I'm not asking whether theta uh, uh, creates correlations between the activity of the neurons. I'm, I'm, my only assumption, my only assumption is that if theta is fixed, the variability is independent. So. Okay, very good. So the input itself might be noisy. Of course, in an experiment, maybe we control theta very precisely, but if we think about the problem more no, broadly. I mean, the input could be one constant sound, which is noisy. And oh, okay, so could, there could be some input from other uh, brain regions which is correlated in different cells, okay, and, and it's affecting the variability in them in a correlated manner. There could be also um, some different states off the, off the, off the brain region that some 
internally <laughs> the, the, the dynamics in this brain region might undergo some, uh, there might be some dynamics which affects together the activity of many cells. Um, mechanistically, this is related to connectivity within the system. Different cells receive uh, similar inputs from, from the same other, from, from common sources, and maybe this causes, uh, and these sources themselves are variable, as you said, so this could generate uh, correlated variability. Um, and another, another, um, another thing is that we're really controlling just theta, but maybe there are other aspects of the stimulus, the visual stimulus, say, the extremely high dimensional uh, stimulus. Maybe there's something else which is changing, fluctuating in the input, which is we're not controlling precisely and is also affecting together the activity of the cell. So I just want to point out that this assumption of independence of the noise is, high, is, is not, is not uh, clearly true. Um, we will discuss um, towards the end of this chapter um, how to deal with uh, variability which is not independent in different neurons. But we will start with independence. Okay. Um, you can you can pr um, um, characterize it and, and provide some bounds on it to say for sure that it is completely not independent. I don't think that there is any uh, example. Um, yeah, yeah, but but okay, it gives some bounds on the on the the, the amount of correlation. Um, maybe you know probably the um, noise in from most of the sources, other than ones coming from the stimulus itself, the noise coming from <coughs> neuro, uh, uh, ganglion cell in one eye and from the other eye are completely uh, unco unco un un independent. Well, not even, just, okay, present uh, some visual stimulus and you would look, uh, observe the activity of a neuron in one, in one eye in the retina in one eye and uh, an a another neuron that responds to the same area of the, re of the visual field in the other eye, these will be probably very, very uncorrelated just because of the fact that uh, the retina does not receive uh, inputs uh, from the brain. Um, there could be some correlation coming from the pupils which are correlated or from the stimulus itself. Anyway, um, other than that, I, I cannot think of a case where we could say for, for sure that uh, there is absolutely no correlation. But there are cases where it's weakly we can characterize and see that it's weakly correlated. Um, okay, so one thing that I want to note about our whole discussion is that um, we're thinking of a high dimensional representation, many neurons responding to the stimulus. and low dimensional input. Right, in the example that I discussed, one dimensional, theta. Um, does this uh, uh, make uh, sense? Why are we doing this? Because what? Well, I, I claim that the individual context, this is very far from, uh, from what the brain is really, d or a central nervous system is really doing. Uh, the, in the stimulus falling on the, on the retina is not low dimensional, it's extremely high dimensional. It's the activation as a function of uh, angle, uh, activation of all the photoreceptors, it's extremely high dimensional. Um, so why are we doing this? It's easy. That, that's, uh, that's absolutely the reason. It's, not, it's easy not just in the sense of conceptually of uh, n discussing this on the whiteboard, it's also easy to probe coding of low dimensional variables experimentally. Okay, so uh, when people started to look at V1, for a long time people didn't really understand what makes a neuron fire. And then Hubel and Wiesel discovered that if you present an oriented bar, then there is strong activity. And then they started to do to characterize uh, how how neurons respond as a function of the orientation of the bar, and there are many many cases like this in characterization of uh, sensory systems in which uh, people probe 
uh, um, probe the response to a very low dimensional set of stimuli. And it's important to keep in mind that it's a little bit artificial. Still, it's an interesting question uh, for this particular set of stimuli, how accurately <coughs> does the population of cells represent the stimulus? Now, this goes back to a question I don't remember who asked me, but uh, what is our point of view? Is this, the, is, is this we're trying to decode the stimulus or the brain trying to decode the stimulus? So sometimes really you just want to observe neural activity and decode it for some reason. Maybe just some, one example that pops into mind is a brain-machine interface. You want to observe uh, neural activity and decode something out of it. But another reason, but the more true reason that typically we look at decoding is that we do want to understand something about how precisely internally the, the brain activity in the brain represents some variables. Maybe we imagine that some other brain region might need to read out the variable um, in order to achieve some task. Um, and um, in some situations, in some experiments, we create a situation in which really a very low dimension is also important behaviorally, because if we look at the task where an, an animal or a human subject needs to perform some, say, discrimination task, or then, then maybe it's really the task makes a certain variable, low dimensional variable important, and we could, for example, compare how accurately um, this is performed to, to and, and try to relate that to the accuracy in which the information is actually represented uh, in the brain. Okay, so this is our point of view right now. T we're looking at low dimensional variables. By the way, um, this example is, example is an example where it's seems quite natural to look at a low dimensional variable. It really seems like the hippocampus, one of its important roles is to encode position. Position is a low dimensional variable, and so it really makes a lot of sense to, 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 think, uh, to think about the encoding of this low dimensional variable by the large population of cells. High direction cells are similar. Okay, so the kind of broad questions that we will want to address Um, fidelity of the representation, how accurately does the neural activity, so we have some model of the neural responses, say this one, each, mo each neuron res responds with some Poisson spiking with the mean, which is dependent on the variable, the noise is independent. How accurately does this joint activity represent theta? This is one type of question that we will want to ask. And another type of question is how could we implement a readout scheme based on the neural activity uh, for the variable? And this is really because, mostly because we're interested we we have in the back of our mind the thought that the brain might need to decode that this, some other brain region observing the spikes from a certain neural population might need to read out the variable and we want to ask how could this be done uh, in the brain. So, These are the broad questions. Um, now, from the theoretical point of view, these questions become, we need to define these questions a little bit more. <coughs> we'll start with this one. We need to define it more precisely. Um, but what we mean by fidelity, and in addition, the question is meaningful only once we um, have a precise model for the neural response depending on the, on the variable, both the, it's, you know, the response and its variability. Uh, and sometimes, in some, in some contexts, it will also be important to ask what is the statistics of the variable theta itself. We will see that later. Okay, so, um, 
So we start with uh, we start with uh, this question, and I want to um, define more concrete uh, questions. So um, in this context, we will discuss two types of uh, tasks that we want, might want to perform based on the neural activity. One is um, estimation. So by estimation, I mean that I, ge I tell you what, is, um, all, what are all the ni. And your goal is to say, what is theta? You provide an estimate for theta, okay? This is estimation. Discrimination, this is the other task that we will discuss, is one where you need to discriminate between some, say, two values of, uh, uh, of theta, again, based on the neural activity. So you just need to say whether it's, say, theta one or theta two. Okay, so let's start with uh, estimation. So our picture is that the brain has been presented by stimulus characterized by one dimensional parameter, theta. This stimulus goes into the brain and all this is a black box for us. But the brain generates, um, neurons in the brain generate outputs that we can read out. So this would be N1, N2, and so on. And we want to estimate theta based on these outputs. So um, uh, for now, uh, I will actually use a different notation. Instead of N number of spikes, I will use R. But could be the same. Yeah, it could be anything, but uh, so from the point of view of just uh, the theory of estimators, um, it doesn't have to be an integer number. In the neural context, usually it will be an integer no a vector of integer numbers. But it's because of that, because I don't want to just when developing the concepts, I don't want to commit to the fact that it's an integer. I, I, I don't use n. Uh, and and um, and the concept, an estimator is nothing but a certain function of this vector. So the estimator, which is a, mathem is a mathematical concept, it's, it's a function that receives the outputs and spits out an estimate for theta. Okay? And um, sometimes we would call this a, a decoder, precise, more precise term estimator. Um, I want to point out that uh, when trying to decode neural activity or, or some random variables in general, um, this is not the only thing we might want to do. We might want to do something more, um, more general. Can, can, can you give me maybe an idea? So instead of just seeing the activity and providing an estimate of theta, what else might we, could we want to do? Make a decision, okay, that's not what I mean. This is even more concrete. And we want a distribution of the theta. Yes, that's very good, very good. So maybe we, might w maybe we might want to say, given all this activity, um, what is the likelihood for every possible value of theta? Is this the um, no. The receptive field is saying, it's related to the receptive field, but the receptive field is saying what is the probability distribution of the activity of each neuron giving the parameter. Now we ask something else. If I provide you with a particular set of outputs of all the neurons, what can you infer from that about theta? So what is the distribution of theta given the activities of the cell? So something like, 
we might want to ask something like, what is P of theta given R? Okay. We will, we will discuss this, uh, uh, this quantity as a way to generate estimators or discriminators, but, but we're, we're thinking our goal, ultimate goal will be to construct an estimator. Uh, okay, so so there are an infinite ways to to construct an estimator. Any function of the R's is a valid estimator, and we want to ask whether a particular estimator is good. So how could we how could we um, rate an estimate or say if it's good or bad? Okay, so you want to quantify how close is its output uh, to the real value of theta. What does that mean more precisely? Okay. Yeah, we could generate some error me measure of error. So, for example, First of all, I just want to point out that there are many ways to do it, but uh, one way to do it is by its mean square error. So what, would, what does that mean? It means that we ask what is the theta of R minus the true theta square and I'm going to average. Now, what am I averaging? What am I averaging on? So R is um, stochastic given theta, and exactly very good. But to really make this uh, pr meaningful, we need to say also where, where, where what theta is. So what is the distribution of theta? Which brings up the point that uh, usually when we discuss the quality of um, decoders, estimators, discriminators that we will discuss later, the distribution of the stimuli itself is important. And it's quite clear, for example, imagine that um, um, theta always, actu actually theta itself is actually is not variable. Suppose that always theta has exactly the same value, then without any any effort, we can construct a perfect estimator, right? We can construct the estimator that always gives that value. It's not very interesting, but it just brings up the point that, that the distribution of theta is essential in order to, to make the question of, a, a, of the quality of the estimator important. But in general, experimentally, If we control it, then it's very easy, yes. Uh, if we think about decoding um, if we think about this as, as a question, if we think about this viewpoint, uh, thinking of decoding as a way to ask how precisely the brain represents variables, then we might want to think about the kind of inputs that the brain receives in a natural setting, and this is more difficult to characterize, but we can also try to do that. Okay, so. So let's discuss some approaches to um, optimize uh, or to construct an estimator. So one is to minimize this error. Okay. Find the this function of R that will just minimize. 
Again, this depends crucially not only on the variability of the neurons, but also on the distribution of theta. Um, can you think, uh, or do you know of another approach to construct an estimator? Yeah, yeah, maximum likelihood. This is related to this uh, quantity. So, <coughs> so by the way, um, I always denote estimators with this hat. So the maximum likelihood estimator uses this quantity. Actually, it's not this quantity. It uses this quantity and chooses uh, the theta uh, for which the probability of generating uh, the output would be highest. Now, why does this make sense at all to do this? We, this is not really what we're interested in, right? We're interested in the, in the likelihood of theta given we observe, we don't observe theta, we observe R and you want to choose the theta which is most likely maybe given the if, uh, R, not the opposite. So why does this make sense? Okay, but, but what is, what can we, how can we do better? Oh. Hmm? Okay, and then what rule, what, uh, what concept in statistics uh, we're using? Map. <laughs> what, yeah, map? Yeah. map? A map. Yes, okay. Yes, which is based on Bayes' rule. Okay, so a, a more sensible way to, 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 uh, to choose theta would, not to, to ma would be not to maximize this, but to maximize um, what we call the MAP, ma maximum a posteriori. I will explain. Maximize P of theta given R. This is what we really, this makes more sense than this. But the reason this makes sense is that these two quantities are related to each other. They're related to each other through Bayes' rule. So we know that P of theta given R, P of R, is equal to P of R given theta, P of theta. This is Bayes' rule. And therefore, um, P of theta given R is equal to P of R given theta, and P of theta divided by P of R. And so what the maximum a posteriori estimator uh, does, that it wants to maximize this as a function of theta, now, note that what we have here in the denominator does not depend on theta, and therefore uh, we choose the value of theta that maximizes the numerator. Okay, so how is this different from this? The difference, the difference is that we weigh in the, the, the likelihood of theta itself. So this estimator, in order to define it, we need to define 
what is the distribution of theta, right? And you can think about this estimator, the maximum likelihood estimator, as the MAP estimator under the implicit assumption that all values of theta are equally likely, which might be true and might be very wrong. Okay? But sometimes we do this, sometimes we do the maximum likelihood estimator we apply, we, just because we don't know what is the distribution of theta, and so this is more simple to, 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 to discuss. Uh, okay, so both when we look at three and when we look at uh, one, which is minimizing this quantity, you see that P of theta enters. Um, so let's, I want to discuss for a moment, um, so let's compare these, these two. Which one is better? is better, the, the one that minimizes the mean square error or the one that maximizes the uh, posterior uh, probability? What? Better. Very good, so <laughs> that's a good, uh, your answer is good. It's, it's, a, it's a meaningless question. Better depends on what we call better. So if our goal is to, is to minimize E, then the minimizing E is better if we, our goal is to maximize the apostory of probability, but what, what, why, why would it matter? So for example, um, this, really this already depends on what is, what, is the, 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 you know, what is the penalty of being wrong. Um, in some situations, we don't, you know, this is a good measure for us for you know, how, we, how we penalize uh, incorrect answers, and then we might want to generate a, uh, um, uh, an estimator like this, but for example, um, if um, if being wrong even a little bit is is very very bad for us, we will die if we will make the wrong decision. Then maybe you know the fact that the error is small is uh, you know this the, the way that the errors are measured here is not uh, what we care about and we really want to make sure as much as we can that we're not making any error and then we might want to to use a maximum a posteriori estimator so so the answer which is better is depends on the context With the maximum of well, each each estimator can make errors but uh, but the way it makes errors is different so so um, You know, if, 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 for example, suppose that uh, um, um, there's a, 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 a suppose that you know that there is some uh, um, treasure hidden somewhere in the in the sand, and uh, and you have some measurements that allow you to estimate where it might be. Okay, you don't care, you know, it, the fact that uh, if you make an error, it, the, if, if you make an error here or here, it really doesn't matter at all, right? Uh, in, the, in, the, in the mean square error uh, estimator, we, we weigh this error as, more, as, bet, as you know, better for us than this one. But we just want to find the, the treasure, so, so any error in this case would be just as bad and the best thing we might want we want to do is to choose the position where it's most likely to to be present, right? So this is an example where maximum as posteriori would be better than uh, than uh, mean square error, minimizing mean square error. Okay, um, let's take a break. Yeah. 
לנו איזשהו נתון, מזכירים משהו אחר שהוא מדהים, נותן לזה משקל שונה, בהתאם לגודל השגיאה הזאת. W מופיעים בצורה של הדחות, אז זה פה. 
ויותר מזה, אם אני מסתכל על WIJ ספציפי, בכל המכפלה הזאת מופיע רק באיבר אחד. והדבר שה-I שלו זה ה-I הזה. אז בעצם, אני צריך לקחת את הדבר הזה, אולי לעשות את זה פשוט פשוט, לקחת את הדבר הזה ולסגור אותו לפי WIJ. פי פי של Y, פי פי של Y.
and in each each example you see he will perform some upgrades based on one example. Here you upgrade it was like iterative but just because we don't know not uh,
So before I get to the definition of what Fisher information is, um, I want to look a little bit more at the mean square error, which I just uh, uh, erased, so I write it again. Yes, what the, this will lead me, the discussion of the mean square error will lead me to discuss uh, Fisher information, and so this is why I'm already putting here the title. So the mean square error is defined uh, in this way. And then um, let's write it in a bit more detail. So what I mean by this is that this is an integral over theta, p of theta, that's prior over theta. Uh, integral dr, which is an n-dimensional vector, uh, p of the r given theta, theta of r minus theta square. And you see, by the way, that the way I'm writing it is I'm, I'm looking at r as some var a variable that can have any, in principle, any value, not restricting it to the integer. Um, and now I want to ma make some definitions. So um, I'm going to define B of theta, which I will call the bias. but right now it's also a function of theta. Okay. This is the average of value of the, what the estimator spits out for the particular theta minus theta. So, imagine situation is one where you imagine that you present the encoder, the brain, in our case, with a particular stimulus theta. You, you run the experiment again and again and again. Each time, the brain generates its output of a neural, activi neural activity. 
which is the stochasticity of the brain. Okay, so, or maybe there are other sources of stochasticity. So, these are the stochasticity of the responses given theta. For each one of the responses, our estimator would give an estimate of theta, and what we're quantifying here is, on average, whether the estimator would provide the, the what is what is the average value of theta that the estimator would uh, spit out compared to the true value of theta. So this is a function of the estimator. It depends, the bias depends, of course, on the choice of the estimator. It depends on the distribution of the responses given theta. It depends on theta. This quantity does not depend on the prior of the of theta. Why does it depend on the prior? Because you see, it doesn't. It doesn't. Because we're because this is not the prior. This is already we have set theta to a particular value, right? And we're only considering cases where theta has that value. You could define also the average bias. Um, would be the average of b of theta over p of theta. This is now not a function anymore of theta. It does depend on the choice of the estimator and all the sources and the stochasticity is prior. Okay, now um, this is just a comment. Uh, what I want to do now is to use this quantity and, and I will use it in order to rewrite the mean square error in a slightly different way. theta of r uh, minus theta as theta r minus the average theta of r for a particular for a, a for, p, for p of r given theta and then I will add this again subtract theta. So this is what we call the bias. Okay. And so uh, we can use that to show that E of theta, if I now plug this uh, in, in the definition here, I'm now considering only E of theta. So this is E of theta would be this, but not yet averaged over the different values of theta. Okay? So E of theta, maybe I, I should write it down, which is theta r minus theta square for P of r given theta. I can also write it as um, the average of theta of r minus its own average And the reason is that if I would uh, take this quantity and take its, its uh, square, then I will have the term B square. I will have the term which involves B times this, but the average of this uh, is zero, right? Because this is already a number, and this its average is equal to this number. And then I will also have the term of this, which is this square. And the nice thing about this term is this you can interpret as a variance. This is the variance of the response of the estimator over different realizations of the um, noisy out neural output. Right? This term is a variance. Right? A variance is a, some random variable minus its mean 
average of that squared. So this is really the variance of the neural response for the particular value, for, oh, sorry, of the response of our estimator for a particular value of theta. And therefore, this mean square error, this, uh, this mean square error, we can interpret it as having two terms co coming from two sources. One is the variability of the estimator's response, which is this term. And this is how much it deviates on average from the, from the, from the, from the true theta. Okay, now, um, an unbiased estimator is defined as an estimator for which there is no bias. B of theta is equal to zero. Okay. We're not going to discuss the question whether it's always, I mean, sometimes it's possible to construct an unbiased estimator, sometimes it's, it's impossible, but we're going to discuss, focus now our discussion on unbiased estimators. So these are estimators that are constructed such that at least on average, they give the correct result, okay? So this is for all theta. And again, I'm going to focus on, on unbiased estimators. Now comes an important uh, theorem, which is called um, involves what is called the kramer rao bound. And what the kramer rao bound says is that for any unbiased estimator, we can provide uh, some lower bound on its error. Um, where I didn't get defined J, so of course the essence is in the definition of J. J is called the Fisher information. And the Fisher information is only a property of the distribution of the variability of the neural responses or the observations. So we have some observations, we're trying to estimate from them a parameter. The Fisher information is only a property of the variability of the, uh, or the distribution of observations, P of R given theta, okay? So if you know what this is, you can, we'll write down in a moment, you can calculate J of theta, and then you can use that to bound from below the error of any, by any estimator that you could imagine that you might construct. Okay, so what is this J of theta? <coughs> J of theta, I will write down now its definition. So, so this is the second derivative of the probability of the neural response with respect to the parameter, 
evaluated at the value true at the value of theta that we're interested in. This itself is a stochastic variable because in each realization of the presentation of the stimulus, the responses are different. Okay? So we take this quantity and now we average all of it over the probability of the responses at the value of theta. So you should note that theta, so this j of theta is a function of theta. As let's remind ourselves, it tells us something about how precisely how precise, what is the mean square error of an estimator could be, might be, a, for that particular value of theta. Theta enters in this expression in two, in two places. It enters here because we're evaluating this second derivative at the position theta prime equals theta. The second? Uh, sorry, the first derivative and it's squared. We're evaluating this derivative at the true position of theta. At, at, the, at theta prime equals theta, and then theta enters again here because we're averaging this all over the neural responses, assuming that the stimulus presented is theta. Okay. Um, often this is written in a somewhat sloppy manner. d log p of r given theta divided by 2d theta square, and that's it. So the theta is written already here. I find this a little bit uh, obscuring what is really being calculated. This is a more precise way to write it and to understand what this expression is actually saying. Now, um, I will continue. It turns out that there is another expression which is equivalent to this. I will not prove it. Maybe we'll do it as an exercise. This is why uh, I said second derivative, and because it, th this expression involves a second derivative. d squared <coughs> uh, log p of r given theta prime with respect to theta prime squared, again evaluated at theta prime equals theta, and average over p of r given theta. So the difference between this expression and this expression is that here we have the first derivative squared. So this expression, this quantity is obviously positive, right? Here we don't have the first derivative, we have the second derivative and there's a minus sign. And it turns out being positive as well, of course, because it's equal to this, but you need to do a little bit of work to show that this is equal to this, okay? And now I want to use this expression in order to interpret, to have some intuition of why the Fisher information is a, a, an interesting uh, quantity and why it might relate to the ability to, to, uh, uh, discrimi to, to, uh, to estimate theta. So So imagine that um, the stimulus is, is theta. Is equal to theta. And we draw some uh, neural responses uh, based on these uh, um, uh, thetas. And we look at these neural responses And we draw um, P, and we want to 
now suppose that we look at these neural responses and our goal is to estimate what was theta. So one approach we might take to estimate what is theta is to draw the likelihood of these neural responses for different values of theta. Okay, so we take these neural responses and we draw the, the likelihood of P of R given theta prime. And for <coughs> my convenience, I will imagine that we look at log P of R given theta prime. And so again, the R's were drawn from this theta, but now we want to ask ourselves, what is the likelihood of these responses given different values of theta? How do you think this will look like? Will it, what kind of function is it going to be? Is it, will it have a minimum, a maximum? Uh, where will they be? Okay, hopefully a maximum around the correct value of theta. Around the, so let's imagine that this is the true theta. We drew, you know, we, we, we generate some neural responses and well, now we look what is, what is their um, likelihood given different values of theta. So hopefully there will be a maximum around here. Will, be, will it be precisely at theta? For one particular example where we presented, that why not? Yeah, there's noise. I mean, if the, if, the, if the responses would always be maximal, if this quantity would be always maximal around the, on the true theta, then we could construct a perfect estimator by doing maximum likelihood. Of course, it's not here going to be like that. The, the response, um, um, so for partic some par one particular example, we may expect that when we, co when we do plot this, there will be some maximum. The maximum hopefully will be close to the true theta but it will not be precisely at that particular theta. So if, for example, if our estimator was a maximum likelihood estimator, we would choose this particular value. And the fact that it's not precisely equal to theta is a manifestation of the fact that there is going to be some error in the maximum likelihood estimator. Now, if we would draw the responses um, again, then maybe um, we will get another maximum at some other value, okay? So um, now we could imagine that we do this experiment again and again and again, and we average these plots over all the experiments, okay? In that case, we would get a plot, so maybe I will write this down. This is R1, this is Some other example, R2. Now we averaged over many of them. And in that case, we'll get something that looks like this. Oops. Made a small mistake. Okay, you know what? I'll do it a continuous line. Now, this curve turns out, once we average over many responses, actually it will have a maximum precisely at theta, okay? I'm not proving it now, but you can prove it yourself. And all these curves at the area you know, of, the, of their maximum have a negative second derivative, right? This is because this is a maximum, not a minimum. So here we're looking at the second derivative. Where are we looking at the second derivative? We're looking at the second derivative at this point. So essentially, you can see that what the Fisher information quantifies is what is the typical second derivative around, the, around this point. And why is that important? Exactly. So if we can expect that if these curves are very narrow, the second derivative is large, these curves are narrow, then we can identify the variable theta precisely. By the way, there is a relationship which I will not prove for them if between the second derivative and the deviations 
the typical deviation that you can, we discussed the fact, right, that this maximum will not be at the true theta. This maximum is not at the true theta, but the typical deviation of these maximums from the, from the true theta is related to the second derivative. But the second derivative, what di more directly it quantifies is you know, how, how precisely we think that you're, we're estimating uh, theta if we're choosing, say, this maximum, because it tells us how much the probability decreases if we vary theta, right? So it all kind of makes sense. The, the second derivative tells us what is the precision that we can estimate for, for our estimate each time. And it's related also for a maximum likelihood decoder. It's, it's also related to the, to the typical deviation that, the deviation that it makes. OK, so again, if the feature information is large, if j is large, the second deri der derivative, it's, abs it's negative, but its absolute magnitude is large. And we have narrow, we, we, we can expect to be able to to estimate the value of theta precisely because the likelihood is sensitive to theta. If j of theta is small, then the likelihood is insensitive to theta and we cannot expect to generate a, 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 a good estimate. Now, another comment is that then the second, then, then this big, the second derivative is large, these curves are narrow, the likelihood is sensitive to theta, and therefore, we can estimate theta well. Oh, okay, so large, so large theta allows us, according to the kramer rao bound, to achieve a small mean square error. Okay. Now, um, I want to discuss some properties of this quantity. So if our observations are independent of each other, in the neural context, we discuss the possibility, say, that the Poisson variability in different neurons is independent. Then we can write P of R given theta as a product over all the neurons or all our observations, P of Ri given theta. And therefore, the log of P of R given theta is the sum over all the neurons log P of R I given theta. And as a result, if you look at the definition of the Fisher information, either this one or, or this one, but it, with this one it's easier, you see that the Fisher information just becomes the sum of the Fisher information in each one of the observations. So J. So the feature information coming from all the observations together is simply the sum over all the uh, different, say, neurons. The feature information, let's put here a theta, just to remain, remember that it's a function of theta, where j of theta is just defined in the same way just for the, for the single neuron. Okay, so if you have a population of neurons that, say, neurons responding to orientation with different tuning curves, each one responsive to a different uh, uh, angle, and now I double the number of neurons, the same properties, and the feature information doubles. The feature information doubles, and the kramer outbound tells us that we can hope to achieve a better uh, mean square error when we try to decode the angle based on their joint activity. Um, this is one property. What is the last thing? Okay, 
So if I double the number of observations, I replace by each neuron by an add to each neuron another neuron with the same properties. And again, we're assuming the noise is independent and the Fisher information will double. Fisher information will double, therefore the kramer outbound goes becomes smaller by a factor of two. So we can hope to achieve an estimate which is better by a factor of two. Now all this... You meant that, sorry, identical neurons? So the neurons themselves, in the, in the example that I gave, the neurons don't have to be identical. You can imagine that you have different neurons tuned to different values of theta, but now I add for each, for each neuron another one which is identical to it. Okay, so um, now all this is... Uh, Nice, but it's a bound. So this brings up the question, why do we care about the bound? We care about the true mean square error. So now comes in the uh, next property, which is uh, important. which relates the properties of ma a maximum likelihood estimator uh, to Fisher information. So, if the responses are n statistically Particularly uh, independent observations, and strictly speaking, we should imagine that all of them have the same. Each one of the observations has the same uh, properties, but um, this is. Okay, so before I, I tell you the statement, I want to discuss a little bit what, I, what whether this is important or not or what this means. So in the examples that we discussed, we might have a set of neurons which are not IID because each one of them responds to a different uh, theta. But now you can think about the joint activity of all these neurons as one observation and now add more and more neurons. Like I said, I, I doubled the number of neurons so I, it doubled each neuron, so you can now replace each neuron by 100 neurons. So we can, go, we can consider the case where we add more and more neurons in over all uh, um, uh, uh, preferences, tuning preferences. So this is the case where this N, then this, this the theorem that I'm going to write down will apply. Uh, we're going to discuss the situation where N becomes infinite. Uh, 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 infinite. No, no, they're independent given theta, given theta. But strictly speaking, the theorem that I'm discussing consider a, set, a situation where we add more and more observations, which are IID. But I claim this is, relate, this is relevant also to a neural system where d neurons have different responses because we can imagine that we just add more and more neurons of all types. Right? R think about the, re the, suppose that you have one neuron responding to each, with a preference for each possible, for, for a set of thetas. This is one observation, the responses of all of them. Now you, you add another bunch and another bunch and another bunch. So this is a way to increase the number of observations to have many different, let me phrase this differently. The theorem tells us something about a, situ something about a situation where we have many, many different observations of the same type which are independent of each other. Okay, you can also imagine just repeating the experiment again and again. You have a bunch of neurons, you provide the stimulus, you measure the activity. Now you do it again and again and again and again. You have many different observations which are independent. Then the theorem tells us... Uh, how are they independent of the neurons? Are because the noise is drawn, each time the noise is drawn randomly. So now you imagine that n is the number of... of independent, yes. Y y yes, okay. So the let me write down the theorem. The theorem tells us that when n go, uh, goes to infinity, first of all, the bias of the maximum likelihood estimator goes to zero. 
And second, the mean square error of the maximum likelihood estimator approaches the Kramer raw bound. meaning that the mean square error approaches as n goes to infinity one over the Fisher information of the n observations. But we discussed the fact that when we have independent observations, the Fisher information is just the sum over all of them, so I can write this as one over n times j, where j is the Fisher information of a single observation. Okay. Okay, so no, it's not. With this is when n becomes, ver when n is very large, this becomes correct. So it's still useful. It's and it's not infinite, but it has just has to be large. Okay, so this is, so you see now that the kramer rao theorem is a very powerful theorem. First of all, it tells us something about any estimator, which is a bound. This is what I erased. It, it's a bound. But it also tells us something about the maximum likelihood estimator. Actually, as, as, as once we have enough independent observations, um, the um, the, 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 the theorem tells us something, this theorem tells us something about the mean square error of the maximum likelihood estimator, and in particular how it scales with the number of observations. It scales inversely with the number of observations. If we double the number of obser observations, we improve our estimate by a factor of two. And because this is the, this is the, this is the Kramer, this is the bound also, it just tells us that the at the limit of many, many, when we have many diff, uh, independent observations, the maximum likelihood estimator is optimal in the sense that it uh, minimizes the mean square error. Now, remember that we discussed uh, in the previous uh, hour the difference between the maximum likelihood and the maximum a posteriori, right? One of them takes into account the prior, the other one doesn't. This one doesn't. You see that it doesn't matter. Why does it, doesn't it matter? that we're ignoring the prior? Because we're in the limit where we have many, many observations. So the more observations you have, you put less, less weight on the prior in the maximum a posteriori. So in, this, in the limit where you have many observations, the prior doesn't be becomes unimportant. Um, one other thing, I, I'm not going to prove this. Um, I don't know, maybe, um, uh, for those of you who are taking Tali's course, maybe he's going to discuss this as well, and maybe he's going to prove it. But I just want to give you some uh, intuition of, of what happens. So this, to do this, we go back to, to looking at these curves. Um, the more observations we have, um, in these curves, this blue and the uh, red curves, kind of just become scaled by the number of observations because this is the log p of r which is the sum over all the observations so the typical kind of magnitude of, of these of these curves will just scale with the number of observations now this is log p of r suppose that we do max uh, uh, suppose that we look at p of r itself how does it look like 